Welcome to Ferment Radio, a podcast series on bacterial and social fermentation. Fermentation can incite social action, spark creativity and bring surprising new tastes to our lives. My name is Aga Bokrywka and I invite you to join us in a conversation on living interconnectivities. From macro to micro, from cellular to societal and from global to personal. They say it tastes really good, surprisingly fruity and smooth. Because of its oily consistency, it can also be used as a tasty dip. Sounds yummy, right? That's Iggy Nock, or fermented seal blubber, one of the many fermented meat dishes native to Greenland. For centuries, meat has almost entirely been the only food available to local Inuits. Fermentation is a way to preserve meat and survive. It adds more taste to it, and it establishes a relationship between life and death. For most people, however, fermented meat is closer to a dead body than to a pickle. Such fermentation practices have often been subjectively represented by foreign media, for example, as something dangerous, cruel or unecological. Today's guest is Avia Hauptmann. As a scientist and Greenlandic Inuit, her research is based on microbiomes from fermented traditional Inuit foods. Avia, before diving into the secrets of Inuit fermented foods, can you tell us more about Greenlandic Inuits? The Greenlandic Inuit hold uh, like a particular place. So there are Inuit in um in the US, in Alaska, and in Northern Canada, and in Greenland, and in Russia. And the Greenlandic Inuit were colonized by Denmark. So for us as Greenlanders, we, in everyday lives, we don't go around call us Inuit. Inuit means people in uh, in different Inuit languages. But in Greenland, we call ourselves Gelashlit, which means Greenlanders. And we have a culture which is very mixed between the Inuit culture and the Danish culture. A lot of us are of mixed heritage and have families both in Denmark and in Greenland. Um, but the Inuit culture, and, and I mean, that makes an interesting case of also seeing the differences that, are there, that exist between the Inuit part of our culture and the, and the Western part of our culture. Um, so we for myself, my family is very big. Uh, my mother has 10 or there are 10 siblings. She has nine siblings. And we are about, I think now, 45 cousins um, from my grandmother. And we're all close. Like I, I would say that in a Greenlandic context, we're more like siblings than we are like cousins. Where in a Danish context, uh, cousins are a little not as close um, and that differs between families of course but in general i would say that families are are quite close in greenland even though they are also often very large um, and one of the ways that we maintain close relationships is through our foods so for my family we have this traditional hunting ground Angriathofik, that has been uh, my family's hunting ground since the early 50s where, uh, to begin with, my grandfather and his family uh, went hunting, and then his kids and their kids, and now their grandkids, my sons, uh, go with us. And and my family goes there. Uh, everyone who can goes to that area once a year in August to go caribou hunting. And and that's sort of where these relationships are established, established and has been through my life in in my childhood and in my teens going uh, with my cousins, uh, going camping for three weeks at a time and either fishing for three weeks or hunting caribou for three weeks and drying meat. So this is sort of how our relationships built. They built very much around the making, the acquiring of foods. And, and I think that's a very important thing to understand about the Inuit. Could you tell us um, 
uh, about some of like uh, the most iconic Greenlandic uh, foods, especially if they are fermented? When I looked into the historical literature around fermented Inuit foods in Greenland, what seems like the tendency is that even if people could choose to have um, foods frozen, they would prefer to have them fermented. And a lot of descriptions about how the Inuit really treasure this the taste of, of fermented foods. I think flavor is 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 a big thing because living off animals alone, not having access to salt or greens that give a variety of flavors, fermentation and microbes have probably been one of the most, if not the most important source of flavor. I think the most iconic one is uh, giviak, which is uh, seabirds, often small seabirds called the little auk, um, that are fermented inside of a hollowed out seal skin. So you catch a lot of little seabirds, uh, up to like five, six hundred of them. And you catch a seal and you take the seal skin um, and you stuff the birds into the seal skin. And then you sew up the seal skin very nicely and very tightly. And then you bury it under rocks for some months, depending on the weather and the temperature and the family who does it, um, it's varying periods of time. And then they lie there inside the seal skin and you eat them raw after that. Uh -huh. And uh, is it like a seasonal food that those birds are appearing just in a particular yes. time of the year? Definitely. Like most other uh, Arctic foods, they have a, a strong seasonality. So the little og, this is a a dish, the Givyang is a dish from the very northern part of Greenland, uh, very close to the polar, uh, to the North Pole. And they appear, the birds appear in May, around May, and then they stick around for about three months. So you have to catch them in that period of time. And that's probably also how and why this fermentation practice came to be, because they're so abundant at only this point in time. And if you want to sort of utilize their abundance for the rest of the year you have to find a way to store them what's what's the taste of kiviak i can imagine it's quite salty right so i think a lot of people expect it to be salty but what's interesting about uh, greenlandic fermentation at least is that no salt is used uh, at all so it's a completely uncontrolled fermentation uh, relying entirely on the weather, the climate, the environment. And I'm not from Northern Greenland. I did not grow up there. So in some sense, I am somewhat of an outsider to this particular dish because I, I, I didn't grow up with this and I have not tasted it. I was there for a preparation, like a making of one. But unfortunately, uh, the climate was so warm. So when I had planned to come back and dig it up and taste it, uh, it was already it had already been taken up because the weather had been so warm that summer. So I, I still have that um, to try. You are researching the uh, the fermented foods from Greenland, but you are also from there. So I believe something which is extremely unique is that. You are not an outsider who is coming to, you know, research from zero on on f some foods which are kind of external from one's culture. Yeah, I think it is pretty rare. At least um, I've not met a lot of other people who look into their own indigenous fermented foods with this scientific angle. And I, I believe that that... Um, it has the consequence that the questions that I ask about my research and the angle that I bring into the research are very different from what I would see someone from the outside uh, doing. What's important to know about Inuit foods and, and traditional Greenlandic foods is that they're mostly based on animals. Um, for a thousand years, we've been eating almost only animals and very few plants. Uh, so of course the fermented foods are all animal based as well. And when you talk about fermenting animals, there are some microbiological considerations that, that you need to acknowledge um, that, that there are some risks 
that are associated with fermenting animals like botulism, for instance, if, if you have the wrong um, environment uh, and the wrong conditions, you are at risk of creating botulism in, in fermenting animals. And, and this has been a, a large focus of the investigations that have, have gone into inert fermented foods in Greenland as well, if you look at the historical literature. But being from Greenland and having grown up with this animal source diet, um, eating animals and fermenting animals is not extreme to me. So my uh, initial question to, to my research was not, how is this food potentially dangerous? But I have to tell you this story about when we went to Northern Greenland uh, over a year ago. And I was going there to investigate this fermented dish, the giviak. And it was a very long travel. And on our way there, uh, I was supposed to be interviewed in the radio uh, talking about the project. And the radio host sort of announced prior to my interview that in a minute we'll be talking to Aviaya. And she's a researcher. She's going to northern Greenland and she's interested in investigating the Giviak. And when the radio host said that, there was a lady in the town that we were going to, to Siorapaluk, who became very angry uh, because she was thinking that I, as an outsider to Northern Greenland, she didn't know me. I didn't know anyone there. I was going in and I was going to come and tell them that their foods are dangerous. But luckily I was interviewed in the radio afterwards and I was talking about how fermented foods have had this revival like yogurts are sources of microbes and, and that's very important to human health to have the right microbes and, and that's sort of the approach that I bring into my research. I, I don't want, I want to understand how they're potentially dangerous, these foods. I want to understand how they are healthy. And because I had the opportunity to say that, this lady... Uh, was no longer angry with me. And in fact, they, her and her family came to the airport and picked us up and showed us how to make the giviak and have become uh, long-term relationships that um, that are based on, on the idea that we want to understand how giviak is healthy and how you know, it fermented foods have been an important part of, of the Arctic diet. This can also mean that this uh, kind of foods were represented in this kind of negative way before, because I wonder otherwise this uh, woman you were you were talking about, probably she would not see it this way. Yeah, that is definitely a symptom of that. And there's this really interesting paper by uh, John Speth, who actually writes out all the reactions that Arctic explorers, so outsiders to the Arctic, have had on fermented foods of the Arctic. And it's it's it really paints this picture that the reaction has been disgust or uh, misunderstandings even. Um, we looked into, well, I, I came across this really interesting piece uh, in, in a book about how wasteful Inuit are. Um, that we just kill animals without even wanting to eat them. And killing animals is very labor intensive. Um, so of course, in a time where uh, food isn't uh, just something that you have in a store, you don't use a lot of resources just to kill animals without eating them. So I was really wondering about this. And when I looked at this piece, it describes a fermentation process, but the person who observes it is someone from the outside who just simply cannot understand that someone would eat a rotten seal but the seals are rotten for him but for the Inuit they're fermented uh, they're for eating at a later point so so fermented foods have certainly been misunderstood in in Greenland with different consequences I think in many cultures fermented meat is is related to, to rotting meat, like mm. a deaf body. Mm. If some uh, people, some, some group of people is so dependent on animals uh, in order to, to survive, it also creates this uh, very strong relationship and almost dependence, right? Then we actually go away from, from exploitation or... I don't know, doing something uh, because we like it. It's just a matter of uh, of being in it together, in a way. Yeah, 
Yeah, I completely agree. And, and that is also the basis of our myths, of our of our belief system that we have had before that you you thank the soul of that animal and the words that we have for animal souls and human souls and coming to life all show that we were all the same we as the internet have always acknowledged that we are animals and respected the fact that something has to die for you to live and I, and I think it's such an important discussion today and, and something that, that fermented foods of, of Greenland remind me all the time is that they can be provocative because you are looking really at something that has died and is decomposing. And it's, it's, it's so much closer to our own bodies than looking at a rotten apple. Um, and, I, and I think that's a very interesting and important discussion also in the whole plants versus animal foods discussion because I, I feel a lot of the debate around vegetarianism and veganism doesn't really acknowledge that even plant resources take resources out of the environment and they do require death also of animals. Um, so we have to acknowledge as human beings that Animals have to die if we want to live, even if we only eat plants ourselves. There are secondary causes of animal deaths as well. And, and once we acknowledge that, we can actually start discussing, so how do we want animals to die for us? Or Because it's not really a discussion of whether or not they have to. But, but if we can look that in the eye, we can start thinking about what, what's the good way of doing it? What's the real ethical way of living? It also started to make me think about uh, like a climate activism, which is of course related to global warming. Vegetarian or vegan diet became one of the elements of um, environmental activism. I would like to hear more from you from the point of a researcher who researches diet, which is uh, mainly meat-based. What would be your stand on that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So the Inuit has had some experience with activism, um, which hasn't been all positive, um, which mostly is, is the story around seal skin exports uh, that Inuit, that was sort of the foundation for Inuit economy for many years until the 80s, where it was banned by the EU um, after activists uh, made the story around seal fur being um, unsustainable and about cruelty to animals, where from an Inuit perspective, it's about being uh, like living off the environment and respecting the environment. So, so the Inuit have uh, not the best story with, with activism. And I feel very much researching our foods. I've more and more, um, I feel like foods is, is sort of the new arena because climate activism has become synonymous to vegetarianism or veganism. If you want to be a climate activist, of course you eat green foods and, and you know, meat isn't green in color or um, in perceptions of people. But I also strongly believe that eating from your local environment and eating foods that um, connects you to your family and to your community and to your environment is the sustainable thing to do. So, so the inner diet has a very particular place in, in that whole discussion around plant-based foods. And, and I'm not against plant-based foods per se, and I, I, I am against factory farming of animals, but those nuances get lost um, very quickly in, in activism. And, and again, uh, as Inuit, we have to try and make the space for our own diet, which is animal sourced, but in a sustainable and in a humane way. Maybe the problem here is that we want to look, or at least some people want to look for the solutions which are, which are universal and uh, not taking into account much uh, very different like living conditions or even like climate and access of certain foods or uh, yeah the resources or or tools and it probably 
is also impacting what even is a healthy diet, right? Mm, I agree. I agree very much. I mean, it's really the whole like planetary health, both human health and environmental health are such complex issues. And even if we can sort of state the problem quite simply, the solutions are maybe too complex for us to understand yet. And and we need to make room for di- a diversity of peoples, a diversity of human beings to bring their solutions to the table. So I, I very much agree with you that huge problems uh, require global and simple solutions is, is really one of the problems here. And how Inuit or Greenlandic diet changed over the years? Why this change happened and how did it impact the local communities? So Greenland has been, was colonized almost exactly 300 years ago. Next year it will be 300 years ago. It's no longer perceived as a colony of, of Denmark, of course. It's a, it's a self-governing nation under the realm of Denmark today. But the colonization of Greenland, of course, uh, led to imports of foods. And in the beginning, imported foods were only available for um, the colonizers who were there. But with time, of course, more and more foods and drinks and and tobacco and all of these things became available to, to the population in Greenland. And for the past generations, we've seen a very rapid change towards a Western diet. But an imported Western diet. And that's a point that I think it's very important to make is that when you say Western diet in the Arctic, you cannot just imagine your supermarket in in a European country or in the US. You have to imagine that supermarket has to be transported all the way to the Arctic. And that is the version of the Western diet that the Greenlanders have. So a lot of, processed foods really and what um, the health surveys in Greenland have shown is that we have a gradual shift towards imported foods and a moving away from traditional foods and following that we have large increases in cardiovascular disease and diet and diabetes and and other uh, lifestyle diseases. I wonder why the traditional fermented foods or in general traditional uh, foods preparation would get lesser popular. Some researchers from Greenland have looked into this a little bit and their hypothesis was that um, people have become alienated towards the fermented foods in particular because I think also the stories that are told about these foods are uh, stories where something went wrong. And we know from research in Alaska that the prevalence of disease from fermented Inuit foods or uh, Arctic indigenous foods increased when modern technologies like plastic and all of these things were introduced. So I think what happens, that's my idea at least, is that when we rely in our everyday lives mostly on imported foods, when when we think of regular foods, we think of imported foods, then traditional foods have a small and smaller role to play. And fermented foods require a lot of skills to make. They require knowledge. They require that you have tried it before. They require someone that you know and someone that you are close to has the skill set to make these foods. And when we rely mostly on imported foods, fewer and fewer people actually have the skill set that's required. And this makes the making of it feel more and more dangerous because you don't know how to rely on on nature anymore because you 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 might not have learned how to do it exactly right so so you worry that you might become sick from from doing it so it's sort of a a bad circle that few and fewer people dare to do it few and fewer people then develop the skill set to do it right there is quite a lot in uh, news these days that um, ice on greenland is melting and therefore some I don't know, ancient or old bacteria are awakening. And I wonder, like, what would be your viewpoint on that? And also how 
could it have impacts like even the diet of the people who are native to those uh, territories? The Arctic as indigenous peoples all around the world is sort of a hot spot for uh, tragic stories or for a uh, looming danger in some ways. And I feel the story about uh, like pest uh, being released from the ice cap uh, and then suddenly spreading new pandemics is is a very um what can you call it like sensational approach to research so and and it's so easy to sell because we're used to the arctic as being this hot spot of climate change and bad things are going on there and if you then dig deeper into the social a part our culture and everything a lot of the stories around us as people are also tragic stories or uh, things that are not positive and and so that fits well in in that whole scheme but i've i did my phd on uh, in like inland ice microbes and i think if from a microbial ecologist perspective a microorganism that's adapted to living on the ice, which is a sicrophilic, extremophilic microorganism, will not just go out into the stream and then go into vertebrates like fish or human beings even and infect them. I, I think it's mostly just about making sensational stories than it is about identifying real risks. Mm -hmm. And it also made me wonder about like a food system in Greenland itself, maybe looking a little bit more into the future, what would you be hoping for? What kind of change, if any, would you like to see? So the food system in Greenland is made in the image of a Western food system. We've adopted in Greenland um, all of our structures, basically, from a European, from a Danish um, model and that goes for our food system as well so politically and policy wise our food system revolves around the imported foods and of course some uh, like very very little agriculture and, and farming down in south greenland but but it makes up such a small fraction that 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 isn't really the bulk of it most of it are dietary recommendations uh, for adults and for children a lot of that is centered around imported foods and some of, some of the hopes that I have for the future is that we purposefully try to incorporate all lo local and traditional foods in our food system. They're still very much a big part of people's lives, but not uh, policy-wise and not systematically. And, and I think that is what needs to happen if we want to preserve the privilege that we have to actually be able to go out into nature and get our own food, then we need to incorporate our traditional foods in a much more structured way in our society. And, and the other thing that, that happens when we focus so much on imported foods is, is that we overlook the potential of our, of our own food. So one example is that, as many other indigenous peoples, the Inuit are often lactose intolerant. But still, if you look at the dietary recommendations for children in Greenland, they say that milk is the most important supplier of calcium and that a child must drink half a liter of milk a day, even though 50% of the children are lactose intolerant. And this in itself is just not good. But it's even worse when you then think about one of the cornerstones of the traditional Greenlandic diet is this small dried fish. In Greenlandic, we call it amasek. And the amasek is dried whole. It's dried with its bones, its stomach content, with everything. And some versions of it are even slightly fermented um, according to some of the research that we did. Um, and the dried fish, the amasek, it, in English, it's called capelin it contains very high amounts of calcium. So we overlooked this food that a lot of people have access to making themselves and that they can go out in the summertime and get and dry and then store for the whole of winter as an important supply of calcium. But instead we look to milk, uh, which is all imported and to half of the population isn't actually healthy. So so I think this is these are some of the things that I would 
love to see change in the future, but also if our understanding of the fermented foods can expand, then hopefully we will be able to safely make a bigger space for those in our, in our everyday uh, foods. Could also some traditional methods or present uh, in those foods, for example, bacteria, could be used also on a um, larger scale or even industrial scale? I, I feel it's very easy to say, yes, of course we could figure out something. But I've actually started steering away a little bit from, from some of those things because I think that that must not be the main purpose. The main purpose must not be to make money from it. The main purpose must be to make foods that people gather around and that uh, families teach each other and that um, are based on the natural environment that we have around us. And then secondary to that, definitely there's some potential there. Um, also because the diversity of microbes in the Arctic is much different from other places. Um, and we do have a large variety of fermented foods that have not been microbially described at all. So I, I do see a big potential to discover new things there and, and new dynamics between microbes and fermentation as well. I feel that every time we do that, every time we try to sort of reduce it down to how does this or this microbe benefit our health, we are um, still not understanding how the whole picture is impacting us. How is it impacting our physical, mental, community health when we have to make these foods, trusting in the environment, doing it in the environment, not based on an industrial product. So let's zoom out. Let's look at the bigger picture. Complex relationships, between elements instead of contextless particles. That is what Ferment Radio is about. If you would like to know more about the show, listen to this episode again, or find previous episodes, please go to fermentradio.com. You can subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and more. I'm always looking forward to hearing from you at hello at fermentradio.com. Ferment Radio is brought to you by Culture of Cultures and is produced by Super Eclectic. Thank you for listening. Keep fermenting and stay tuned for the next episode of Ferment Radio.